Well, let's go ahead and start. This is um, uh, HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript uh, tutorial two, getting started with CSS. Um, let's first talk about the objectives and we'll look at some examples of CSS. Now our objectives, uh, we want to explore the history of CSS, uh, study different types of style sheets, explore style precedence and inheritance, apply color in CSS, use contextual selectors, work with attribute selectors, apply text and font styles, uh, use a web font, define list styles, uh, work with margins and padding space, uh, use pseudo classes and pseudo elements, and then insert page contents, uh, page content with CSS. Uh, CSS, you can think of it as just changing, uh, though it's much more than that, uh, just changing how it looks. Here's an example. And um, I know that's kind of small, but I'll go ahead and read it to you. Browser window background color is set to color value HS 27, 73%, 72% using the HTML style rule. The H1 headings appear in white on a dark orange background as specified by the H1 style rule. So we're just changing what it looks like. Uh, the idea behind this is not, so, not necessarily just change what it looks like, but efficiently change what it looks like. So if you do have like that million pages I was talking about that Amazon or Walmart might have, you can have your style sheet set up and you make a change in one place and then it's propagated throughout your entire website. Um, used to be it was a huge ordeal, and it still is, unfortunately, a huge ordeal to change the look of your web website. Um, people like to change the look of the website, though, uh, because it represents change. We're not still doing the same thing we did 20 years ago. Um, so it seems like they're constantly uh, upgrading what the uh, website looks like. Uh, Cali updated theirs not too long ago, uh, so it had a new look. Now some examples. I think the, the PowerPoint really doesn't do justice on what exactly is CSS unless you see some examples. This is w3schools.com. I'd uh, recommend if you're trying to learn web-based technologies, this is probably the best um, website out there for that. And I'm going to go to Learn CSS. And where I can go through um, all of this, there's a ton of uh, different, different um, items here. This shows uh, an example. Where we got a body, and then we got a background color, light blue, um, for our H1, which uh, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, we got our color um, white, uh, text line center, and then P, um, our paragraph tag, uh, font family Verdana, um, font size 20. So if I click try it myself, this is specifically where you see it embedded uh, in this place. It's in, the, uh, it's in the header section. So it's right here. And then it's got its own style. And then down here, it, uh, it's got a slash style. So that closes it. And then uh, background color, light blue. I could change this, uh, assuming there's a light red. I can't change that to light red. Then click run. Maybe there isn't a light red. Let me change it to red. Changes to red. Um, you can see that you obviously don't need to know what colors are available on this, which, you know, an easy uh, a Google search will quickly give you that information. Now here we got H1 defined as color white. And notice that the um, this says my first CSS example is white, isn't it? So if I come here and put blue and click run, see it changes it to blue. But even more than that, because you don't see really see the power in that, is if I had a bunch of H1s, uh, H represents a header. 
Um, so it basically makes it bigger so you can see it easier. You might say, why don't you just change the, the font? Um, if you're designing your web page uh, for somebody who's visually impaired and you got a, a reader, they say using um, these is, is a better. People can can um, have it read to them better. I don't understand why I, I never have. Well, I have installed a, a, a screen reader, um, but um, I don't understand the significance of why that's better. But anyway, from a design standpoint, they tell you to. Now, if I had an H2, and I'll say this is my second um, paragraph, or not paragraph, a second heading, slash H2. And if I run that, you see that uh, this is my second heading. It's a little bit bigger uh, than a paragraph, um, but not as big as the, C the H1. And there's all there's all the way up to H6. H6. This is the smallest. I'm trying to remember. Did the tutorial out there cover H's? H1 through H6. Hmm. Uh, then I run this. You see, then that's a that's the smallest. Now. Um, the power of it. Okay. This is another another H1. And then if I run that, you see this is another H1. You see both of them are blue, aren't they? So now imagine I, I have a <laughs> one web page, but let's say I had one web page, I had 20 of these in there. If uh, they decide that uh, I want to change the color of it to yellow, I come in one place, change it to yellow, and automatically, whenever it brings up the brand new page, it's changed in 20 places. But even more than that, instead of having your style sheets uh, saved within just one, one HTML, HTML document, you can have them saved over here in a separate file. And then you bring it in, so you import it in. So then, if we have our million pages, and we have uh, five uh, H1s in each, each of those pages, instead of having to make five million changes, we change in one place, and it's propagated automatically throughout. So again, that's the power of it. Now, you can probably tell from the look of it how to do it. If I come up here, if I want to change H2, for example, what do you think I'd do? Type H2, do my beginning curly bracket, say my color is going to be, uh, I don't know if purple is a color, we'll try it, and then I'll do a closing curly bracket. Now spacing doesn't matter, I, I went back to clear to the left just from a cosmetic standpoint because I want to look like all the rest. Now if I run that, it changes from black to purple. Um, so, so again, uh, you can apply anything. Notice I didn't put a text line here, did I? Um, you don't have to have text line. You can have a numerous um, elements here, which we'll we'll see um, some of the, some of the list of those. Okay, that's uh, one example. That's where you put it up at the top. Um, let's see. Let me look at this one. Colors. Tomato. <laughs> I'll try it, uh, try it myself. And whatever that is, is tomato. And um, I can have a different paragraph tag. And I'll say style, style equals background color yellow. And this is another paragraph. Then slash P. So then if I run that, you see it does yellow. So you don't have to put it up at the top to affect the entire web page. You can put it on each individual tag. Now, not all tags uh, will give you, um, give you this. 
For example, if I did an HR, I'd be shocked if it works, but let's try it because I never have tried it. Uh, say style is background color. And um, let's see, what do I want to make it? Uh, orange. And um, I'll put in a slash there. Now, if I run that, see how that just comes up as black? Um, I didn't think it would change it. Uh, images, if you had an image in here, I doubt if it would uh, change it if you did a background color because the image, unless it's a transparent one, then it might. But uh, image by itself, you can't see behind it. Any questions on generally what is a what is styles style sheet? Oops. Okay. Again, way back when, um, back in uh, 1994, 95, when I was a webmaster. Um, we weren't using style sheets. I'm not sure if they existed back then. I could look at the dates and see. Um, but I changed each web page individually. Then front page uh, came about, and it allowed us to set a template, a style, and then push it out to all the web pages. Fantastic. Saves a lot of work. And this this is the next evolution. You don't need a, uh, although most people do use some kind of package. You don't need a separate package for it. You can create your style sheets by hand and push it out. Uh, appearance of the page is determined by one or more style sheets written in the cascading style sheets language, CSS. Um, this is not a programming language. with like a for loop and while loop in it. Uh, this is more of like a markup type language. Uh, latest version is CSS3. It's built upon several modules where each module is focused on a separate uh, design topic. You got um, types of style sheets, browser styles or user agent styles, styles built into the browser. So different ways that uh, it will have something to display. Um, so that's beyond your control. That's the browser doing it. Um, User defined styles, styles defined by user based on a configuration setting of the user's browser. So I think we looked at one, one web page, I think it was this class, where it had the um, check for which version of IE you're using at top. Remember that? So depending upon that, you can tell it which, um, which style sheets to use. Um, external styles, styles created by website author placed within a CSS file and linked, linked to the page. So this is what I was talking about. You have a separate CSS file, and you're importing it in and link it into the each individual web page. You got embedded styles. Styles added to the head of an HTML document. We looked at that example over in that uh, CS3 school, um, where you can put it up at the top in the header section. Or inline styles. Styles added as elements, uh, as element attributes within an HTML document applied only to that particular element. That was this right here. You're putting a style sheet in there and you're applying it only to this H1. If you do any other H1, it will not have that style applied to it. If you put it up here in a header section, though, that's where you're going to see that um, you can apply it to every H1. General syntax of a CSS style rule is you got a selector and you get your beginning um, brace and your closing brace. What in the world does that mean? Selector. Um, let me go back to that first one. That was probably the best, the best way to really show that. Uh, where is it at? CSS home. Mm. If I looked at this right here, which one do you think would be my selector? Let's 
what comes before your curly brace. H1. Selects. It selects which uh, HTML tag we're going to apply this to. Then you have your curly bra uh, uh, beginning brace, your closing brace, curly brackets. And then inside, you have your properties. Property 1, property 2. What that's referring to is color would be uh, our first property. Text align is our second property. Now, the nice part about some of these packages that do this for you is you can say try, try it yourself, and that's really nice and everything. But as I start typing T, it does not pop up with what I can do, does it? Um, that's why some of those editors you use for this, it'll pop up. You start typing T, it lists all the properties that are specific to the style sheet. Um, so you can then easily, if you don't have memory like me, you can easily choose the one you want and then you set it. Browser extensions are an extended library of style properties in the browser. Uh, vendor prefix indicates the browser vendor that created and supports the style property. Um, KHTML is Conquer, uh, MOZ is Firefox, um, uh, Camino. I haven't even heard of some of these. I've heard of Conquer. What is Conquer? Which uh, operating system? I've seen it on Linux, um, but might be on other ones too. Um, MS um, is Internet Explorer, Microsoft. O is Opera. I guess Nintendo Wii browser. <laughs> so if you're trying to design it for the Nintendo Wii browser, um, then I suppose you can yeah, you can uh, you can plan it accordingly. Uh, WebKit, Android browser, Chrome, Safari. Um, if you're trying to design a web page, there's a lot of uh, considerations I have to take into account. You can't just assume because it looks good on Google Chrome, you're set. Um, that was my biggest headache is trying to get it to look good on every browser. And we've come a long ways to providing uh, different different features that get around that, um, but it's still an issue. I don't think the wind's even blowing that hard out, is it? Oh, it is. Oh, okay. It wasn't this morning when I got here. Interesting. Now. Um, Exploring style rules, vendor prefix indicates a browser vendor that created and supports the style property. What does that mean? It means you can use a property that was developed by, by Camino, whatever Camino is, but it's not supported by the other browsers. So if you take it over to the other browsers, it will not look good. Uh, so you have to be careful about it. There, there's some standard ones that are supported, I'd almost say, by every browser. But then there's some that may look really cool and you think, I'm going to use that. And then you put it in there and all of a sudden you're getting calls from customers saying, hey, I can't, your page looks like crap. I can't do anything with it. And those are the calls I get, by the way. <laughs> Marketing and sales would receive those at IFR and then uh, they would send them my way. So well, I'm going to transfer you to David Hayes. He's the one who does a web page. And I'd be listening to this customer go on about, oh, I can't even see this. You know, it's, it's clear to the right and blah, blah, blah. It's like. Okay, sir, I'll, I'll take a look at it and see what I can what I can do and, and um, headaches. I don't think, uh, was anybody going into, uh, want to do web design for a living? I don't see any hands. You never know what you're going to end up doing, though. Okay, embedded style sheets. These are inserted directly in HTML files metadata by adding the following element to the document head. So this is put up in the header section. You do your style, your closing style, and then what, whatever rules inside. Your inline styles. Uh, this is where you got an element like H1, and then you're putting a style right within that element. And we looked at that. Um, let's see, defines that. Okay. The more specific style rule has uh, precedence over the more general style rule. Uh, specificity is an issue when two or more styles conflict. What in the world does that mean? 
Okay, I'm over here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat. Um, oops, I better get it all. Grab style, go up to style here. I'll copy that. You can put these right in Notepad, by the way, in your own web page and see the results. And then I'm gonna go back to the other one, which was background or colors. These colors would. I go to colors here and um, try it yourself. There it goes. I come up here. I need a header header section. I need a slash head, and then I'm going to do a control V to paste that in. Then we've got our style sheets in here. Now um, we got all of our different elements in here, H1 and so forth. I've also redefined H1 down here as Dodger Blue. So let's run this. Actually, this sets background color, doesn't it? Where this set what? Color. So let's just go up here and choose background color. They should be the same. And let's run that. It didn't change anything, did it? Now, if I come here and put H1, um, this is number two, flash H1. Then uh, notice that this is getting the white from here. So this is generally what you say every H1 is going to look like. If you override it in a specific H1, then that over, that overriding uh, property is what's going to be set. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I suppose there could even be uh, three levels of overriding. Uh, that I can think of, though maybe even more now. You know, it could be that you bring in what H1 looks like from an external file. You have what H1 is going to look like up at the the header section, and then you define H1 at uh, individual level. I would guess that um, what you have defined in the header section will take precedence over the file you're bringing in. So the file is not going to really do anything for H1, but I could be wrong. Um, those are things you want to try and see how the override works. That's what they're uh, talking about. When you got two rules, you know what happens exactly. It says the last one that is defined last has precedence. Style inheritance, a uh, process in which properties are passed from a parent element to its children. For example, the following style rule sets the color of article text to blue, and the rule is passed to any paragraph or other elements uh, nested within that article. Interesting. What if I can uh, if I can set that? Okay, got rid of that. Um, come down here. Here's our paragraph. Um, we got a style in it. Then within here. Um, I wonder if I can put an H6 inside of a paragraph tag. This is 6. An H6. Yeah. That didn't work with H6. But you can put other elements in here, and if it's uh, appropriate for that HTML tag, it'll, it'll um, apply to it. The idea of your H1s and H2s is you don't, um, you know, it has has some precedence over the other tags. You'll probably see that more and more. 
when you're um, looking at um, different web pages. That's becoming the new standard is using uh, like H1. I never used them way back when. I know what they do. But if I wanted to change what something looked like, And you can do this in a web page too. I would come here and uh, make this in more important. I would uh, put like a 36 to it. Like that right there. Um, what's wrong with, wrong with that for somebody who's blind? Yeah. Uh, well, it reads it for him, Screamer. Oh. Screamer goes like, this is my text. And it's just like chop, very choppy. Um, but it will not it will not tell him that I increased the font size to emphasize what's going on with it. And instead of doing the font size, uh, changing like that, what you do is you got these styles right up here. And you see there's a heading one. I'm surprised it doesn't go to heading six. Unless I do the drop down. Uh, hmm. But anyway, if I choose like heading one, heading two, um, then uh, and they're all, these can have their own, like you can create a style here. Then somehow the reader tells them that this is, uh, you know, like heading one uh, or this is emphasized, this is more important, stands out. We had a we had a whole um, little session on this, a uh, real exciting session on um, uh, ADA compliance. Um, and I, I recognize the importance of it immediately for somebody who's visually impaired, but it wasn't a very exciting session. <laughs> but they're telling us, don't, you know, don't increase this to your font size, uh, you know, and so forth. Um, come over here, use these headings. And uh, then that'll be a lot more meaningful. I wonder why it doesn't go up through um, H6. That, that bothers me. Let's see, create a style. Um, hmm. Oh, well. I've done web design, so I knew exactly what the, the session was about, so it's kind of not too exciting. Okay. So then, browser develop, developer tools, they allow developers to view HTML code and CSS styles. They make it easier to allocate the source of a style that has been applied to a specific page element. And they're different in each browser and updated and improved constantly. Browser developer tools. Have you ever gone to the browser developer tools? No? If you bring up Google Chrome, if you have a computer in front of you, there's this box over here. And you can go to more tools and developer tools. And a lot of um, browsers have this in some, uh, some form or another. Some are more meaningful. Some have different different items. Um, console failed load resource. This will show you errors you have. Like let's pick on Cali. They got some issues here. Now, how serious are the issues? I don't know. Um, so I'm not sure what these things do here. I'm, I'm never very good at sockets. Here's a web socket connection to visitors.live um, socket IO click stream. This could be that they're tracking who's going to Cali in some manner. They, and while they may not be able to track uh, specifically, I don't know what Cali is doing. Um, maybe it's just generally where are our visitors coming from. They do that for YouTube videos. Um, like in my YouTube videos, I can go look to see what countries are viewing my, my videos. 
Not sure what that's used for, but <laughs> maybe where you'd want to do your marketing at. I don't know. Uh, Cross-origin read blocking, whatever that means. Um, they're going out to this idsync.rlcdn.com. Uh, um, some features there. Visitors.live. Let's, let's see what, that, what in the world that is. I'm not going to go directly to it because you never know what it might be. Visitors.live. Here's eight, um, eight free tools. That sounds like Cali. Uh, for <laughs> if you don't have much money, then you know you kind of go with the free tools. Uh, maybe they're out there. And you see for website visitor tracking. Um, so I could go out there and see what that tool's doing and and so forth. Why is that important? Well, if you're developing a new web page, there's no use for you to write all this from scratch. You know, you you go out to a competitor, you see what uh, what they're looking at, and then you can imp implement that on your own. Probably implement it correctly so it doesn't error out. But um, let's see. By the way, it's it's I'm I'm poking fun, but um, you know, it could be that their their servers down at this point in time. It could be my connection. There's a lot of variables cause things not to work. So now to click over here to sources, you see uh, there's a CSS. If I expand that, here's animations. Dot CSS. Do we have animations that bounce in on our screen? Added by Andy Meaton. So if your animation, whatever our animation is at Cali, is coming in too fast, too slow, it looks like uh, these are the settings you'd want to go and adjust. So understanding... Uh, what the style sheet is helps you to figure out, you know, what, what's this doing exactly. Again, the idea behind this is if we had an animations in 20 web pages at Cali, you can bring in this one animations.css and change it in one place and it affects every animation in the entire website. <clears throat> Um, this guy's going to be real curious what we have bouncing in. Unless it's these images or something. Uh, here's bootstrap.min.css. Unless I'm missing something, which I am. See how I'm scrolling and writing, it's all in one line? <laughs> I was wondering, why in the world are we, are we bringing that in? Um, if, I, if I took this file here, I don't know if I can say, actually save that from here. If I save as, let me try it. And I'm going to save it to um, uh, documents. And click save. Now, if I go to my documents, got Bootstrap here. I'm gonna try to open it with WordPad. Open with WordPad or Notepad plus plus plus. I forgot what it was. Notepad plus or Notepad plus plus. I don't remember. Um, this tells me a little bit more about it, and I can actually see it. It's still not looking right, though. It put everything on. Um, well, there's they're separated down here. And I have no clue what all this this is doing. 
this is what it takes a while to, to design. Now this is referring to um, GitHub. What's GitHub? Does anybody know? What is it? Repository of repository of whatever is probably the most appropriate it won't term. Lead what? It won't lead you into GitHub. Let you get into GitHub? Yeah. That's four oh four. I think that's just that one one project. Um, GitHub is a kind of a place where you can go and store your code. You can store your documentation. People can uh, download uh, data from this. Um, this talks about uh, this this um, bootstrap. It says, uh, okay. <laughs> permissions, commercial use, modification, distribution, private use, limitations. Uh, here's a license when you can use it. Um, Issues people are having. Link badge focus, double border, no border bottom, um, floating label stays at empty. Does it look like it has issues? It's like every day there's a new issue goes out, right? Doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. <laughs> um, just when you got anything that's kind of complex, you're going to have a lot of a lot of problems. Now, um, if you did an explore here on GitHub, and uh, I think the MacBooks have a GitHub built into it, uh, such that you have the source you do, your programming you do, you can store it right there. If I um, search for um, what's COBOL, probably. Maybe not. Maybe I gotta be back at the original GitHub. You see, there's something called COBOL script, whatever that is. Um, so these are projects people have done, and they put it out here. If you got open source and you want to share it with the world, then you can you can come out here and you can uh, you can store it. Um, I wonder if it'll bring everything up. No. Uh, let's see. Explore. You probably can search it by um, topics. Last I used GitHub, I didn't have very good luck. I was very unhappy with GitHub. Um, there was a... Um, uh, potential job. Um, I like doing remote jobs. It gives me something to do at home, projects to do, and so forth. And uh, the the job was to maintain a LMS system called edX. Um, like you use Blackboard, edX is a free version of Blackboard. And this company um, was going to hire me for I think it was about twenty five hours a week, and they were going to pay pretty good too. Uh, and to uh, maintain edX. Well, they gave me the location of the GitHub um, repository for edX, and I had documentation out there, and I followed the documentation and downloaded it to the MacBook. Uh, they had actually sent me a MacBook Pro so I could get it installed and so forth. I'd been doing some work for this company before, so it wasn't like they just sent it to somebody out of the blue. And um, so they sent me this MacBook Pro, I followed the directions to a T, it would not work. And um, there was one other person that they were getting that was going to also maintain it, and he couldn't get it to work either. And finally, I said, I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not sending MacBook Pro back. I can't, I can't get it to even install on this this machine. So I obviously can't uh, change the code. That's pretty disappointing. It broke my heart when I had to send that MacBook Pro back through the through the mail or through UPS. I don't know if I can do a search for edX and find it here. There's the open edX uh, platform. I'm not sure if this is the one I went into. 
Now, besides just having um, you, uh, your files, they also give you documentation. Um, this is how you can download this and install it on a MacBook Pro, in theory. Never could get it to work. I like Windows, to be honest. <laughs> I know it's a it's a dummy uh, version of, in terms of programming, but uh, it's nice to have a uh, nice little setup.exe to double click and it installs your program and so forth. Uh, Linux can be a challenge. It really can be because I I'm not a total idiot on Linux. I can you know I can uh, follow the directions and everything, but um, it took a lot to to figure out. In case you're wondering, they did get edX working. They just hire, had to hire a company or had to experience in it. So, not me. <laughs> okay, here's a, a fob, whatever a fob is. Flyout website banners position. Now this oftentimes works with uh, like a script. So you have a script that goes along with a style sheet. So this isn't the entire thing, but uh, this is something that they've added in. Okay. And I don't know what all these are. Could be things that they're bringing in for the website. But anyway, that's the developer tools. This is going to become uh, quite important later on in this course. You'll be writing JavaScript code, and uh, with JavaScript code, it just doesn't work. You're sitting there, well, that's great. It didn't work. If you come here to the console, oftentimes you'll see the error message of why it didn't work. And then if you go to the sources, you can use this in conjunction um, to figure out uh, where, where it went wrong. There it is. I was looking for the web page itself. See, here's a here's the uh, actual web page for Cali. Looks like they're bringing in scripts. Um, what's this do? Google Analytics, Tag Manager. You know how do you uh, how do you work with Google such that you know your website appears pretty high up, right? You know they um, they provide uh, this information. Um, Google Analytics is more just like how you can appear at the top. There's a whole reporting suite uh, that goes along with it. Um, I started writing one one thing using Google Analytics for um, for Cali, and then they, they ended up going a different route. But it's a whole suite. Um, you see here are your imports. These are where there are separate files. I assume this means you can bring in awesome fonts. And then that's the end of our style sheet. So that's embedded, I'm assuming, end up here in the header. I didn't, I wasn't paying attention. Yep, there it is. There's our header. Pretty much it has to be if you see that style there. Scripts are up in the header too, so I knew that had to be there. Okay. Writing style comments. Um... Characters, the character set rule defines character encoding used in a style sheet. Uh, you see the app, character set, and then and the, the name. Uh, CSS comments provide information about the style sheet. Um, so author name, current date, and what is it used for? You know, we brought up, uh, I don't know, four or five style sheets that Cali uses. We have no clue what they're used for, do we? Um, somebody new starts. At Cali, and they're they're asked, okay, the last uh, web webmaster was a horrible horrible individual. You know, she she did a bad job. Um, we want you to redo it. They go up and look at those style sheets. They have no clue what they are used for right off the bat. 
So that's where they have to do a lot of research. If you put comments in there, then that simplifies it. Also it helps you if you have to look at it two years from now, three years from now, are you going to remember it? No. <laughs> so that's probably even more important is that you, you make your life easier. And you see the slash asterisk and, and then the asterisk slash. Again, that's what starts it and closes it. Importing. We saw this in Callie's website. Remember the at import and then your URL and then whatever your your website is or your your file. Um, Cali. This um, this is located under a folder called CSS. So in theory, what I could do is come up here and do a slash CSS to look at that folder. Now, uh, people that really um, don't want you snooping will set this up such you can't view that folder. You see how it came back and told me, uh, oops, we're sorry, page not found. Um, that's, that's an example. Um... Unless they give you a reference here. Sometimes you can give it a beginning part, so it, uh, then, you, then you can look at it. Uh, similar to adding link elements to an HTML file. Here's working with color, uh, color values. You can just type in name like red, green, blue, so forth. Uh, there's RGB also. Um, express a set of numbers in CSS. Um, so you, whatever the numbers might be, you can put in there. If you got any kind of um, uh, graphics package, I think this uh, machine has paint.net on it. You bring up paint.net, you choose the color color tool up here and you can choose uh, whatever color you really like if you choose more it'll give you the red green color settings there's lots of these there's a lot of online ones that do that um, I think uh, I, I, I started my own web design company at one point in time I realized that I very quickly didn't want to do that anymore it's very tedious I hated it <laughs> I I had um, I rented a server five hundred dollars a month, and my idea was I was going to do hosting on it. So I was going to do sell hosting to all these companies, and I'd also do web design. And I think uh, I got a total of five customers. I wasn't very good at the marketing side. It's a wonderful plan. I rent the server; they maintain it completely. If it goes down in the middle of the night, I don't even receive a call. They reboot it, they get it up and running, so they provide everything. A hard drive fails. They replace it. Um, so nothing on my side. Even they give me a 1-800 number to call for my own customers um, so that if if they notice their website's down, they can call this company, this number. I do not even get called. Fantastic plan. And back then, hosting ran about uh, $25 or $30 a month. So I thought, well, I'll start off, um, you know, maybe getting a uh, start off small, get 100 customers. You know, take 100 times 30, you know, suddenly I'm getting $3,000 a month, 500 of it's going to, um, uh, to the, you know, the server rental. And then uh, the other 2,500 I'm pocketing. Government gets half, so I get an extra $1,200 a month. You know, small, you know, not very much, but that's, that's starting out, you know, to begin with. And then I very quickly envisioned a thousand customers. You know, you start adding a zero to that. And then um, I'm getting 12, Twelve thousand dollars a month. Is that right? One thousand two. Yeah, uh, ten thousand dollars a month after taxes, let's say. And um, ten ten thousand dollars a month. At that point, I'm uh, on a beach somewhere with my laptop, watching the money just roll in. Wonderful plan. Um, but what do you got to be good at? The what? Web design. Actually, this was just hosting, even. So I wasn't even really doing anything there. Marketing. I stink at marketing. 
Um, I started taking a class at Butler on marketing. I dropped it though. I realized uh, I'm not going to ever be good at this. You know, marketing is, is a, it's a talent. Um, you know, and I, I didn't have that. So I transferred those, uh, customers I had to a, um, to another provider and, um, got out of that business. Uh, oldwestcasting.com used to be a website that I uh, created. They did uh, movie productions here in Kansas. That was one of them. Uh, another one I did was a place, and I can't remember the website name now, but it was a, their office was downtown Wichita. And so I would change change what they wanted. They'd say, I want the uh, kind of tan background. So i take my laptop with me, and I'd show it to them, and, so, and they'd say, uh, that isn't what we want. Could you make it more pinkish? I think I made three or four trips back about color. And, um, that's when I decided I, I can't take this. I, I don't have the patience for somebody wanting me to change it to slightly, uh, darker pink or uh, lighter tan. Um, so you have to have patience if you're going to do that, uh, web design. Um, hexadecimal numbers, number expressed and base 16 numbering system. I never have done that. Whenever I've done colors, it's using RGB, but, um, I've seen it. Usually it's web websites, uh, that do that. Like, um, do you know what a, the number of red is in hex? No, I, I have no clue. Um, you know, if I came here. What is red in hex for uh, web design? Probably even can't even find it. Mm, here they are. Red is pound FF0000. Well, isn't it is easier just to type red? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I haven't really uh, got into these. I know I know what their purpose is, but um, I just this is where you got a package that puts that in there for you, not where you're sitting there and got all memorized. And this talks about the color edition where you got red, blue, green. And you mix red and green together, it gives you yellow. Um, you mix red, green, and blue together, it gives you white. Is that right? I didn't think it'd give you white, but maybe it does. I suppose it depends upon what percents you have of each one. Um, hmm. There's also HSL, uh, color values, hue, saturation, lightness. And I'm not real big on this. If you're in graphic, if you've taken any graphic design classes and you probably studied this, you notice over here, um, they call it HSV. Hue, saturation, and whatever V stands for. What is it? Just value? Hmm. There's one that's, um, I don't see specified here. Uh, that allows you a lot, um, lot more variety of uh, colors. You know, for the life of me, I don't even remember I, if I finished that website for that company downtown Wichita. So I, I know I got really irritated. <laughs> I kept driving up there, and, the, and then they wanted to change this color or that color. I should have printed off all the colors and hundred different pages and took it up to them and made them pick which color they wanted. But, um, I don't even think I had a color printer for that uh, purpose at that time. Opacity defines how solid a color appears where you can see through it type of deal. And um, it shows you how you can change that. The idea on this is just to give you an overview. You're not going to have this all memorized. Um, if you work with CSS every day, then you probably uh, will have some of these memorized, but not all of them. Understanding the basics and, and that it is possible then allows you to go ahead and search what uh, what properties are available. 
for the color. Or, I mean, not for the color, but for the tag. Okay, defines the text and background color. We already looked at that. Progressive enhancement, a technique of placing the code, conforming to elder standards before newer properties. Uh, provides support for older browsers, allows newer standards to be used by the browser support them. At some point in time, you just have to give up. If somebody is on IE1, don't worry about them um, because you just can't keep um, supporting the old uh, forever. <clears throat> Contextual selector specifies context under which a particular page element is matched. Uh, context is based on the hierarchical structure of a document and involves relationship between parent element containing one or more child elements and within those child elements, several levels of descendant elements. What does that mean? When we're talking about parent and child, just in regular HTML alone, we got, um, let's see, our HTML, got our body, you got an un, um, unordered list. Okay, I'm lying to you. We got an ordered list, slash ordered list. We got our um, list items here. Um, item one, item two. And then I'm going to end my body, in my HTML. Save. And I'll save it in documents. And this is going to be called test.html. And I'll open that with uh, Google Chrome. Got item one, item two. Numbers on them. Now if I come in here and um, let me put it after this. I don't embed these a whole lot, so I'm going to have to play with this a little bit. I'll do another ordered list. OL second list one slash li um, now this is our outer one and see where it's indented and this one is embedded inside the other OL, isn't it? So it's kind of like a child of that. So it's based upon that. So when they're referring to um, that hierarchy and how things uh, progress, then that's uh, that's one example. Um, talks about the contextual selectors there. I'm not going to read all that to you. Uh, asterisk is always a wild card um, in computing. It's also a multiplication in programming. Um, attribute selectors, ID, class, spec identifies specific elements within a document. Class identifies a group of elements that share a similar characteristic or property. We'll see examples of that. And... Um, It shows the attribute um, selectors where you got your element pound sign ID and you see it got H1 pound intro, uh, pound ID, and then they got pound uh, intro. 
Um, let me go to another website. Actually, Cali's fine. I go to about. And I don't remember if ours is set up this way. Employee directory. Maybe. Did I click it? There it goes. Okay. Now let me go to the... Um, let's see. More tools, developer tools. And I'll click employee, employees. And we'll see if this is designed this way. Doesn't look like it. But the idea behind it is, you see how I click D? That takes me down to the D's, doesn't it? So, when you're talking about an ID, this is where you're giving something a, a specific name, um, so with a value. Um, it could be that you affect everything with that, that name. Uh, working with fonts. it again I didn't go into oh that's nice I'll probably bomb off the uh, recording <laughs> or no it'll shift it over but that's okay uh, working in fonts typography is the art of design appearance of characters and letters on a page uh, Color and font are one of the few properties in the uh, CSS family of uh, typographical styles. Text characters are based on fonts that define the style and appearance of each character in the alphabet. The general structure defining font for any, font, for any page element is font-family and then colon fonts. Where fonts is a comma separated list also known as a font stack. What you're finding a more is, especially in education, um, they're wanting you to discourage you to use a lot of these identifiers um, because a student coming in who's visually impaired um, may not necessarily be able to use some of these um, appearances. So it's going to a lot more bland. Uh, I'm not supposed to use red. Why is that? People are red, green, colorblind, right? Green's a bad color to use. Um, <laughs> really, they emphasize just using black a lot. Um, so, a lot of this you can control via via these um, these style sheets and so forth. Specific font identified by name based on a font definition file stored in a user's computer or accessible on the web. If you rely on a user's computer. What's wrong with specifying a font? A courier. It requires that they have um, that font on their machine. Do you think you have all the fonts on a Nintendo Wii browser that you would on? Uh, no. Um, so what looks great on yours defaults to the st uh, standard uh, stock font on their browser may look horrible. Um, now, there are ways to put it on, the, and they say, or accessible on the web. There is a way to embed your fonts so that it will download and look good on everything in theory. That's assuming the browser allows you to, to bring it down. Generic font describes the general appearance of uh, characters in the text, but does not specify any particular font definition file. Uh, sports font groups, uh, serif, if I'm saying that right, sans serif, monospace, cursive, and fantasy. And here's just showing you some web safe font stacks. Um, 
things you may think are a fantastic font shouldn't be used. And so they got very specific ones. They they gave us two we should use for education purposes. I don't even remember what they were. <laughs> like I say, what wasn't that exciting of a presentation? Um I suppose the first time I have a student that can't see something because it's my fonts curly, although I pretty well go with standard stock or standard stock uh, fonts. So whatever, whatever comes up by default. Have you ever go to a Blackboard, Blackboard page where they really um, customized it? Maybe nobody cares that much, <laughs> but you have to be careful about it. Web font. This is a uh, definition font is applied to the browser and external file because web safe fonts limit the number of font choices. This talks about embedded open type, a compact form of open type fonts designed for use as embedded fonts and style sheets. True type font, uh, font standard based on Mac OS and Windows, uh, Windows operating systems. Uh, open type, OTF. Um, Fonts, font format built on true type format uh, developed by Microsoft. True type. Have you ever heard true type before? There's a, you know, an, uh, I don't find that exciting of an area, but um, some fonts look horrible if you resize them. Um, some fonts, you can't tell the difference between the letters. I had a student one semester. Um, I think his name was uh, Ilya. I think I'm, I was never sure. Um, when I'd get emails from him, it'd be uh, it'd look like L L L. It's because that font they're using the I uppercase I looked like an L. Um, so <laughs> whenever I'd look at it, I was just like I'm, I was pretty sure it's an I. I think I looked it up one time in a course roster and so forth. But that's the problem. You got these fonts that should be should be uh, universally, you know, you can bring it up, you know, from a from an instructor standpoint. Shouldn't I be able to see a student's name? That's kind of important, right? Um, so I'm definitely not an expert on fonts. You can go and read more about these. Scalable vector fonts, font format based on XML vocabulary designed to describe resizable graphics and vector images. What's so great about vector images? If you take a small picture like this and you blow it up, huge, what does it look like? Blurry, kind of looks bad, doesn't it? Very um, blocky type. I got a huge monitor at home. I bought a TV and I, I mean to even get a bigger one because my eyes aren't that great. Plus, I can have multiple windows open. It's fantastic. Um, but if I look at images, images look horrible on it. So anything I look on Facebook now is just like, well, this is crap. You know, this is like images don't look good. Even when I make it smaller, they still don't look good. Um, I think I didn't I create you a um, uh, YouTube video on that uh, glow problem. I think I did, didn't I? Um, I th well, when I created it, the um, Java is not set up to resize based upon a huge TV as your monitor. So it's, it's about this size and you can barely see it in the video. Um, and I haven't figured out how to resize it yet. Um, I'm going where I should be going to tell it to ignore the, you know, ignore that I got a big TV and have it pop up normal, but it doesn't. I'm still struggling with that. Hopefully, whoever watched the video can actually see, not to <laughs> fumble around with it. So, probably not, since I receive uh, I've received quite a few um, uh, questions on uh, Glow format. So. Okay, to access and load a web font, you add the at, at font dash um, face rule to the style sheet. And I'll show you that here in a minute. Uh, once a web font is defined using the uh, at font face rule is included in the font stack. This is an example. You do at font face, you begin curly bracket, closing curly bracket down here. You font dash family, you put the name of it. And then if necessary, you put the source down. 
this is where you can have a uh, have it located out on the website so it'll download so even though you don't have um, a fantasy font um, it'll download it for you now it doesn't download the full font so you can uh, use it in the word or something like that um, you actually have to buy those uh, people put a lot of effort into de developing new fonts so they look great and then they sell them to Microsoft and so forth um, so they don't want you just to willy-nilly put that anywhere and think it is free okay and um, so we've got our format and then that comes from there and then um, Earl again a second one and um, we got our descriptor one descriptor two where name is the name of the font Earl is a location of the font definition file text is an optional text description and the descriptor one value pairs are optional style properties of the font. So different different properties you can do for the font. We looked at one of them. I think we looked at color, didn't we? You know, we can change the color of the font. So that's an example. To set a font size, use a style property, font size, colon, and then uh, the size where size is a CSS unit of length in either relative or absolute units. Um, absolute units, fixed in size regardless of the output device, are used only with printed media. And then relative. Well, if you got a uh, web page you're looking at on the, my big screen, my TV at home, um, lots of space, right? If you're looking at uh, something on your phone, is there much space? No. So um, oftentimes you do things relative based upon uh, positions on the screen. Um, I don't think there's anybody in the Android development class in here. But um, like you do it relative from the left side. So you do it uh, 20 over. And then you do it relative from the right side, 20 over. Such that if I turn my uh, phone sideways, it automatically resizes it. So it's 20 and 20 on both sides. That's relative. Absolute is where you're like hard coding it, saying it starts here, ends here, no matter what. Even if your device isn't wide enough to even see it, it's going to do that. And you see that it says, um, and are only used with uh, printing media. That's where they're best used um, because uh, for the most part, unless you're developing something unique, a piece of paper is a standard size, isn't it? So that doesn't change. Uh, scalable fonts with EMS and REMS. Uh, text is made scalable with all font sizes. Uh, express relative to default font sizes. Um, three relative measurements used to provide scalability are percentage, uh, EM um, unit, and REM or root uh, EM unit. And... Um, me in the show and I know it's good over the side there um, shift shift 